The Gospel according to Luke and chapter 23. <clears throat> We're going to start to read at verse number 32. The Gospel according to Luke, chapter 23, and verse number 32. <clears throat> Other nights we read about the Lord Jesus as he was brought before the council, Jewish council, then as he was brought before Pilate, and now judgment is given concerning the Lord Jesus that he should be crucified. And now we'll begin at verse number 32 to see what happens next. Luke 23, verse 32. And there were also two other malefactors led with him to be put to death. And when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, there they crucified him and the malefactors, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots. And the people stood beholding, and the rulers also with them derided him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself, if he be the Christ, the chosen of God. And the soldiers also mocked him, coming to him, and offering him vinegar, and saying, if thou be the king of the Jews, save thyself. And a superscription also was written over him in letters of Greek and Latin and Hebrew. This is the king of the Jews. And one of the malefactors which were hanged railed on him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man hath done nothing amiss. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. And it was about the sixth hour, and there was a darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. And the sun was darkened, and the veil of the temple was rent in the midst. And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost. Now when the centurion saw what was done, he glorified God, saying, Certainly, this was a righteous man. I would like you to turn now to the Gospel according to John. The Gospel according to John. Johannes Evangelium, Kapitel 3. Gospel of John, Chapter 3. Uh, maybe we'll go to the beginning of the chapter just for a verse or so. I'm interested in verse 36, but we're going to look at a few others first, maybe. Uh, John chapter 3, uh, verse number 3, first of all. <coughs> John chapter 3 and verse number 3. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Turn to uh, verse 16 next. John 3 and verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And now verse number 36 that I had on my mind. In the first place, John 3 and verse 36. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life. But the wrath of God abideth on him. That's all I purpose to read for the first part of our meeting here tonight. 
We're very happy to have everyone with us here. We trust the meeting will be a blessing to each one. And if there is someone among us not yet saved, may this be the night when you would find the Lord Jesus Christ as your own Savior. We commence to read there in Luke chapter 23 from verse 32 on, and really what we were looking at was the crucifixion account, where the Lord Jesus Christ, and here this is uh, as Luke tells it, the details that he gives, and he speaks about a man uh, more in detail than all the other Gospels. That one particular thief uh, that had a change of mind and that received such a marvelous, wonderful promise from the Savior. So as we look at this account, Luke's account, I would like us tonight to, of course, first of all, think about the one who was nailed to the center cross, the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. But then I would like us to look at those two malefactors. Now there was two thieves, one on each side of the Lord Jesus. We sometimes sing with the children, three crosses standing side by side of broken law aside. Two, that's the one on either side of the Lord Jesus. Two, for their own transgressions died the middle one for mine. So here are those three crosses portrayed by Luke in his account. And he writes about those three men that were nailed, each one to his cross. And every one of them is unique in his way. Of course, the center one was struck with him is none other but the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. And he really is that central theme of all of the Bible. Right from the beginning, Genesis to the back, the end, the revelation, we have the Lord Jesus Christ in one way or another portrayed and brought before the reader, whether it is in picture form, in prophecies, in the Old Testament, whether in the gospel accounts we have those real-life accounts of eyewitnesses that were with the Lord Jesus or lived in the time of the Lord Jesus and had a profound knowledge of that person and could retell accurately what, was, what it all was all about concerning the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And throughout the rest of the New Testament, we have very vivid descriptions and explanations of the gospel message that all lead to the person of Christ. The center cross, the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, nailed there at hands and feet. Why? We're going to get to that. Then there was those two other crosses, and we read about them. So there were two malefactors, two criminals, that were crucified together with the Lord Jesus, one on either side. Prophecy from 700 plus years before was fulfilled in every detail that the Lord Jesus would be numbered with the transgressors. Here he is in the midst of two thieves, crucified just like a common criminal even though upon examination no one could find any fault with him. So does that not raise the question again in our mind, so why was he there? They couldn't find any fault in him, a perfect man, a sinless man, the Son of God. And yet he was numbered with transgressors, nailed to the cross, put to death, just like a common criminal. So those two on either side were criminals. They were there because they had committed crime. And if we had read the parallel passages in Matthew and in Mark, we would have gotten some, some good detail regarding those two malefactors, what they had done, what they were doing even there when they were nailed to the cross. I'd just like to pick out one. You know what they were doing? They were joining in with the crowd and they were mocking the Lord Jesus. That means that they were speaking bad about the Lord Jesus. And they were telling him, listen, you save thyself and us. They were saying together with the crowd, if thou be the king of Israel, if thou be the son of God, come down from the cross. They were mocking the Lord Jesus. 
they did recognize that he had done many wonderful, uh, many wonderful works, miracles. So they would say, and they said it in mockery, he saved others. Now that was true. They, they, had, they had seen that. He saved others. Let him save himself. And then we would read, he saved others himself he cannot save. Now that wasn't true. The Lord Jesus had tremendous power at his disposal. He could have called, as he explained in the garden to his disciples, he could have called more than 12 legions of angels to avenge himself of all his enemies, to free him from that situation, but he didn't. Come back to that question, so why was he there? We're going to get to it. Thinking about those two criminals again, Luke now is the only one that will tell us a little bit more specifically what happened with those two men. There was one, we read, he was railing on the Lord Jesus. He was mocking him. Verse number 39, And one of the malefactors which were hanged railed on him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and not us. No change. That's the same that we read in the other gospel account. But now I would like you to notice verse number 40. But the other. Now we have a change in this man. Here is a man, a criminal, crucified with the Lord Jesus, and he had also just joined in with the crowd, mocking the Lord Jesus, making fun of him. But there's a change now. But the other, answering rebuked him. So he rebuked the first malefactor with whom he had just joined in with the crowd together. They made fun of the Lord Jesus. But now he's rebuking that first one. And he says, Dost not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. And he continues to say, But this man hath done nothing a myth. There is a change. I would like to think about this for a moment. So this man, what brought about that change? He was just one of those thieves, one of those malefactors, hanged to the cross and nailed to the cross together with the Lord Jesus. And he had been just like the same with the crowd, with the other malefactors, all the same up to a certain point. And now there's a change. What brought about that change? This malefactor, he would have witnessed as the Lord Jesus was put on the cross. No resistance. The Lord Jesus Christ offered no resistance. He willingly allowed men to nail him to the cross. There would have been no word in his own defense, no word of swearing, no word against the soldiers, nothing that came from the lips of the Lord Jesus. Just as a lamb led to the slaughter, quiet. Just as a sheep before the shears, quiet, silent. Prophecy again from Isaiah 53, fulfilled. Now that would have been something they had never seen before. A man who would allow others to nail him to the cross and he's offering no resistance. 